Okay, so uh, my name is Johannes Grenzfurtner, and uh, that's me pointing at a non-existent penis. And uh, I'm part of Monochrome, and Monochrome is an art and technology and theory philosophy group from Vienna, Austria. That's how Austria looks like. Austria is primarily known for uh, music and mass murder. I will not talk about music and mass murder today. Because the theme, uh, the theme, the TH is always a problem for the non-native speakers. The theme of today's panel is let's play with the world, games, art, activism, and other subversions. Okay, you probably already read that in your, um, on, the, on the web and whatever it is. So let's try it together. This panel invites five game designers who are artists to the, no, no, one, one more time, one more time, one more time. <laughs> This panel invites five game designers who are also artists to discuss the boundary between art, games, and activism. It is a standard reflex for people to think they are helpless in the face of mighty governments and corporate power. Ooh, yes. It is not true. Why? No! In a media-based society, everything is controlled by a cultural grammar of the public space. The habits and conventions of society, our ways of speaking and thinking, the images and stereotypes which give shortcuts to meaning in our lives. That means that the power wielded by the big institutions is more like a fluid or a jelly than a solid brick wall. And we can play with it. Yes, we! So let us, as game designers, game players, artists, activists, and other fellow nerds, leave our cozy peer groups and comfy scenes behind and talk about what we can do to play with the world. Yes! Okay. My name is Johannes. Uh, we want to start uh, the panel with brief introductions and brief micro-talks by our fellow panelists and then we'll step into the wild world of panel discussion. Okay, so my name is Johannes Grenzfurt and I'm part of Monochrome, as mentioned. Uh, we are peeing of a modernist sculpture since 1993. Uh, we do many, many uh, projects. Our basic idea is to find the perfect medium for uh, distributing an idea. So the perfect medium of mass distribution of an idea, a philosophy, an interesting thing. Of course, we have uh, worked with games before, just a couple of examples. Just recently, we uh, were uh, present at a GDC in San Francisco. God hates game designers. Indeed, he does. Uh, Thou shalt not monetize thy neighbor. Uh, People, yeah, some people liked it and they understood the joke and the commentary. Some people hated, hated it. They spat on me. They said, why do you hate what I love? And I said, because God hates you and energy drinks and all the other stuff. Do you really want to end up like Ian Bogus? No. Uh, yeah, and Phil Fish, but whatever. So we did that just recently. We introduced the world to the concept of uh, massive multiplayer thumb wrestling, a concept good enough that Jane McGonagall is selling it as her own. Uh, <laughs> the Brave New Punk. Brave New Pong is actually a game, it's a game about competitive gaming or uh, not competitive gaming because you can actually not win it because you control the ball and you try to move the ball outside of the playing field but the paddles stop it. So you can never win it. It's aw, it's kind of, it's a shame. But it's also a commentary. Uh, Ars Electronica is a festival we're organizing now for a couple of years about sex and technology. And this year, just a week ago, we did Ars Electronica about games. Gamification and its discontents. Uh, for play, we uh, um, invited game makers, designers, but also theorists and different kind of nerdy folks to present games about sex, sex tech games, stuff like that. Just a couple of images. We have uh, the Lego spanking. We have the awkward sex by uh, Paolo uh, uh, Pietro. Uh, Pietro, of course. Ah, all the stupid Italians, you know, similar uh, names. Uh, Different things. Uh, next year, of course, invited to join us again because we decided from now on that we want to incorporate games as a standard variety in all future Ars Electronicas about sex and tech. So if you want to uh, have a sex game next year on our, at Ars Electronica in San Francisco, bring it on. 
Uh, this one, for example, uh, a project we're working on right now is about Wikipedia and that Wikipedia is actually not really that cool because it's helping humanity to gain knowledge. No, it's a fucking cutthroat uh, game about hierarchical elitism and how people like want to grow, they want to be supervisors, they want to kill other people's uh, sites, they were just... They and that's why it works. The incentive of Wikipedia is not knowledge, it's killing other people. Uh, and uh, we kind of like that, and we're working on, on, a, on a paper now about all of that stuff. That's Robo Exotica, the festival for cocktail robotics. We're doing that for 12 years now in Vienna. So people build machines that mix cocktails, serve cocktails, drink cocktails. And we also always have uh, cocktail machines that are actually games. You have to play with them, for them. You have to play to get your alcohol, whatever it is. Uh, this year, Monochrome, we are working on this thing. You might know it, Arkanoid. Uh, just imagine that you control the, the, the Arkanoid paddle down there with your glass. And every time the ball is bounced back, it squirts out alcohol. So you're actually playing the thing with your, with your glass and you, you, you want to you wanna catch the alcohol that's uh, squirted out uh, down uh, uh, the thing. Okay, this one here, San Francisco, a couple of years ago, it was a game challenge to design a trebuchet, like a um, kind of like catapult. Uh, and it was called Experience the Experience of Catapulting Wireless Devices and PDAs and Smartphones. So people could come, bring their smartphones, they could build the trebuchet, and then we would use uh, wired magazines as counterweights <laughs> to catapult the wonderful new technology. It worked actually pretty well, a really shitty animated GIF here. Look at that, Whoa! and there it goes, okay. <laughs> Try it at home, please, do it. Uh, this one is in Vienna, but we also did it in Montreal. Uh, we kind of transferred uh, pen and paper role-playing games to, to the theater stage. So people were sitting uh, on the theater stage, uh, pen and paper uh, players, but also celebrities, and they were kind of like playing a pen and paper role-play, but people could watch them play it and also jump into the action be with them, some people from the audience would be, would be non-player characters, stuff like that. Worked out pretty well, I'm very happy with it. And we always had a live uh, drawing session. So there was one guy sitting there drawing all the stuff that's going on on screen, for example, this wonderful piece here. Last piece uh, I want to talk to you about is Soviet Unterzirkersdorf. It's a fictitious country we, ma we made up a long time ago. Uh, and this fictitious country, of course, also has a supercomputer. It looks like this. It's called Hyperhegel. And this Hyperhegel works that you heat up the oven to 1500 Celsius. And only if you heat up the oven to 1500 Celsius, uh, the computer would actually boot. And the only thing you could play on the computer is Tetris. It's a tactical simulation from the Soviet era. Uh, <laughs> And you always need two people to play. You need one guy to heat and one guy to play. Uh, and you heat all the time because the very moment it drops under 1500 Celsius, and that's really high, the computer powers off. Uh, and our, our, our maximum amount was like two guys, one heating, one playing for seven hours. That was uh, pretty, pretty good. Uh, we made a whole adventure game series out of the concept of Soviet Unterzirkersdorf. It was uh, Edge Game of the, uh, of the Month in November 2005. It had half a million downloads. We were really happy about our first adventure game having so many downloads. Uh, so we, we kept playing with the whole idea and right now we're working on this project called Zero Zulu. It's the first feature film based on an indie computer game series. And I'm very happy uh, about that. It's a bizarre conspiracy about industrial espionage, open media, and political intrigue. Uh, and uh, that's uh, from me so far. That's my crazy name, my crazy email, and my crazy Twitter account. Uh, and now I would like to introduce the next uh, member of the panel, my fellow neo-Marxist Mar Marxist, uh, friend, uh, Paolo Petersini Molle Industria. Uh, so... There are many great things we can do with video games in the realm of representation. You know, we can criticize the existing um, status quo. We can uh, uh, criticize uh, the systems we inhabit. We can uh, provide, uh, you know, like a representation of uh, other hypothetical systems. You know, we can provide uh, transforming experiences through role play or through immersion. 
and um, we can demystify the language of video games and so on and so on. And that's all, 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 all I'm trying to do with this project called Mall Industria. But uh, I don't really have time to present it in uh, five minutes, so I'm going to talk about something completely different and uh, hijack the whole panel. Uh, so. Uh, there is another uh, political uh, aspect in gaming, which is not about what really happens on screen, but uh, how about um, games are essentially made. Uh, because games uh, you know, are also products or commodities, and game makers are workers inscribed in the, into the existing uh, uh, relations of production. And uh, last year, like two years ago, was here I proposed to frame the indie game movement as a part of a larger trend uh, that r kind of like ranges from uh, you know the punk movement from the 70s and 80s to today's makers and uh, you know sustainable farmers, for example. Uh, my argument is that indie gaming movement is uh, yet another instance of a soft rebellion of mostly skilled workers, not necessarily skilled workers, who realize to have a, a kind of excess of creativity, the creativity that cannot be, uh, that exceed, exceeds the ability to the cap of, of the capital to be commodified. So uh, I believe like these subjects are kind of like intentionally leaving the massive corporate structures, directly or indirectly competing with them. I'm talking about us, by the way. Uh, and uh, <laughs> they are creating alternative networks in the process. And uh, they are like, they don't look, we don't look for uh, forms of rewards that are, uh, you know, not exclusively monetary. Like uh, we are looking for things like uh, reputation, friendship, personal empowerment, and so on and so on. And now uh, eventually the capital catches up and restructures itself. It changes shape in order to extract value from uh, these new dangerous desires and energy. So, and sometimes it also disrupts these alternative networks that have been created in the, in, in the meanwhile. So, uh, I, I believe all the major transformation of industrial capital can be seen as a resultant of these two diverging vectors, the working uh, class tension toward autonomy on one side, and uh, uh, the capital's ability to steer uh, this energy away from uh, you know actual actual autonomy and self-organization. If you think about like industrial workers organized the Occupy factor factories and sort of threatened uh, socialist revolution in America, in America too, and Harry, Harry Ford came up with you know higher wages, which uh, uh, turned out to be uh, pretty pretty good also for you know uh, the creation of middle class and having like uh, more purchasing power and so on. When uh, the, in the 60s and 70s, uh, workers were still unruly and still pissed because working in factories. Uh, still sucked regardless of the wages and uh, you know like there were new desires of liberation were emerging and that at that point the time the capital uh, responded with automation and then later on with uh, outsourcing uh, you know like sending production overseas and moving toward the material economy in the west so like ba back back to gaming in our field uh, this restructuring uh, consists uh, in a shift toward uh, uh, the control of platforms and distribution system. That's what I argue. And basically, like, corporations say, oh, so you, do you want to be independent? Do you want to, be, to make your own uh, uh, game that represents yourself? Uh, that's cool with us. You, uh, you, just, you just take all the risk, the, you know, the entrepreneurial risk, and uh, we'll just make sure that you, uh, you know, like, you're still, in, you're still dependent on us for uh, its distribution or for its, like, deployment. So we can claim, this, this is what the corporation says, we can claim a big chunk of the business. So um, at this point, things get a little bit more confused to me because we have these new forms of dependence uh, from, from corporate uh, entities that are not the same uh, of like, you know, uh, uh, labor, like uh, non-self-directed non labor. And, uh, and you have some, well, you know, uh, some game ma makers who ben benefit from this new compromise and some others that mm, benefit a, a little bit less. But yeah, and there's networks and relationships that are uh, being uh, somewhat disrupted and they are like uh, put under stress and to some extent. And uh, I, I, I notice that a lot of people these days are trying to re-problematize, redefine or think about like uh, what, is, what, is, what is this indie thing uh, again, like uh, now that the uh, kind of the context is changing. And uh, there are some people who are just like throwing hands in the air and basically saying, uh, oh yeah, indie doesn't mean anything anymore. And, uh, and I disagree. And I'll propose a different way of framing independence uh, that has nothing to do with this panel, but sorry, sorry about that. Which is what follows. Maybe, maybe it has to, has to. Uh, which, is, which is what follows. First, uh, indie is not a Boolean value. You're mostly a programmer here. Uh, it's not a true false statement, it's not a line, uh, uh, but it's more like a, a continuum, a gradient. And uh, 
it's a gradient that represents, if you, if you want, a degree of compromise with the capital, which is not a degree of purity, it's not a, like a personal moral stance, also because uh, you have to consider some other uh, factors, like some people have more negotiation power with the capital than other, uh, due to education and class, so um, like not, uh, not everybody can afford the same uh, degree of independence, regardless of the moral standard, uh, moral stance. So like this is an infinite gradient because there's no escape from the matrix of capital. There's no outside of capital. It's, like, it's kind of like our second nature. Uh, there's no absolute depend independence because uh, uh, you always be constrained by technological platforms, by languages, protocols, hardware, infrastructures. And uh, it's an infinite gradient that goes both ways forever. Like, I cannot possibly picture the least uh, independent game developer. Who is that? Like, I have no idea. Is it, is it the, the code monkey working on uh, slot machines for Zynga? You know, like, uh, is, is that the least independent? No, I, I think there, there might be even, like, something more degrading, more uh, awful yeah. than that. Because, oh, yeah, like, there's no limit to the fantasy of capital to, you know, destroy your life. Um, so... In the, in the same way, I cannot even like uh, exactly picture the most independent uh, game developer in the world. Like my example is like, oh, maybe could be an African mo woman making open source games uh, for her local community and games that only run on her uh, her devices that are solar powered and open source as well that she designed from scratch. Yeah, maybe, but maybe we can al also con conceive something more independent. So. Uh, I think there is a practical, pr practical way to conceptualize this absurdity of uh, independence, this immensity of this infinite gradient, the infinite continuum, which uh, I borrow from the utopian and anarchist thought, which is, uh, which is this. Utopia is, uh, by definition, is unattainable, but it provides a direction. Utopia is like this uh, tiny flickering mirage at the horizon, and by the time you reach it, by the time you're there, utopia already moved forward. So, uh, and yet, I, I think it, it, utopia is necessary. Like, an utopian idea is, fu is fundamental because it provides you uh, both a direction, but also a reason for a, a constant tactical engagement with the status quo. It pushes you to, you know, to break away from, the, from, from these forces constantly. And, uh, you know, these forces that are making us mi miserable, more or less miserable and screwing up the entire world. So this is like how I like to think uh, about independence in gaming and, uh, and in culture in general. Not a status, but attention and a direction to pursue. And the, color, and the corollary is uh, uh, maybe like uh, in this uh, independent event, where maybe we shouldn't, hear, we shouldn't really be here to, you know, to celebrate our little club or to you know, uh, exchange, exchange business cards or like uh, tricks or how to milk this uh, indie brand for profit, but maybe we should, uh, I'm done, <laughs> should be here to, you know, to conspire about how we can be more autonomous, how we can uh, move another step toward independence. Yay. Thank you. Yay. Yes. Yeah, the European leftists, uh, they're a little bit melancholic, but you can count on them. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, Natalie, a big applause for our next uh, uh, presentation, Natalie. Okay, now this is going to be a drop of entertainment, adrenaline and testosterone that you have no idea. <laughs> so, uh, be ready. Um, I'm an architect, um, I do work often with uh, other architects and artists in what often are uh, installation, very participatory installation. Um, and for example, this is sending birds into the sky and being picked up by Wu Fan Slam from Casa Grande Ginzala, the Finnish architect. Or I do work as project manager for Mariko Mori, a Japanese artist. This project shows a big wave UFO in which you enter and your brain wave are scanned and being projected in the dome inside the wave UFO where you are laying. Uh, so very different things from game, but very participatory in some way. And I do work as an architect, as you expect an architect to do, build things and, and design stuff. And, and I do work on games with Eric Zimmerman. That is mainly because he's workaholic and I'm his girlfriend, I guess. <laughs> That's the two things. Um, but where I, we did maybe a few projects together now, five. 
And what I realized we have in common, although the projects are usually very severe and very, um, uh, very composed, and I, I like things to be clean and ordered, which become compulsory. Uh, there is always some way, uh, an attempt to break the rules of what you expect, or in a subtle way to uh, make a twist that maybe through the play more than through the content that you see immediately, but through the play experience, there's a shift which is making you think, oh, there's something wrong about it, or um, this is Six in Ton, for example, a game in which, uh, Actually, you pay other player to uh, to do what you want, and the twist, I guess, is at the end the winner uh, has been paying everybody else, and at the end of the game, everybody has more money than he has. And when he checks the rules, there's nothing written about the money and him getting any money back. Um, and again, it looks like a sad kindergarten otherwise, uh, and that's the game. Another game was uh, Starry Heaven, which was for an event, a night at MoMA. And the game, again, wants to be a little bit fable-like and like a uh, uh, sort of mythological uh, representation of power. So there's a group of people trying to take the place of the ruler, which is at the center. Um, and you never last long time as a ruler, but the whole point is to try to be the ruler yourself. And again, in its form, as it represented that game, there's nothing uh, revolutionary about it. It's uh, very uh, composed. Uh, and the same, I guess, is for uh, Interference, which is the last game I did with Eric. Um, what we tried to do in this case was to work with an in, uh, redesign a space and have, as a game board, a five vertical, very translucent wall. Uh, in which you will play, play a very, very simple strategy game, which at the same time became extremely complicated, maybe even to explain to the player, because what you will do to gain majority in your game board was to steal pieces from other player, which was extremely frustrating because what you were thinking was your game got continuously messed up and ruined and bothered by somebody else. Uh, interfering with what you were doing. And there's a very short, um, this is not the official video, but it's during the opening, in 16, um, showing what was happening. But it ha becomes sort of a beehive in which you move from one wall to the other. And uh, somebody saying no because he's got stolen, I guess. Uh, and, and my role in the game is to Although both Eric and I work on each other, uh, I, I work with Eric in the game design and Eric works with me in, in the physical uh, representation of the game. I do like to think that the game would not be able to exist if it wasn't in the space which is enabling you to um, know that you're not in a real situation and it's a little magical and unique and pleasing to be. I stick to my three minutes. <laughs> sure. All right, I'm going to try to stick to five minutes. Um, I got a new computer and discovered that I didn't bring any of my talks with me, so I'm actually not going to show you any of my art, but I'm going to talk about all of my art, which is going to be really, really confusing for everybody. So apologies. Um, if you're not familiar with what I do, you can just sort of imagine that it's exactly like what everybody else here does, but less good. Um, <laughs> I make weird interactive things that make you question the world around you or questions about the internet or basically my goal is just to get you to think or at least that's what I did for a really long time uh, and then I started making games. Um, but uh, because of that, you know, when Johannes asked me to be on this panel, I was like, oh, well, I don't know if I do art activist stuff and then I was like, what the hell do I even do? Um, a lot of the time when I'm making things, I'm trying to think about like, all right, well, I did all this conceptual stuff and now I still do some conceptual stuff and I really love art, but now I'm making games like word games, which are boring and don't say anything about the world. So, um, Bell Tower. Um, <laughs> and uh, 
So this is like a huge tension in me. It's like, what are, what, how do these things relate? What are these things doing? Um, and a lot of times, I am thinking about this and wondering, is it worth my time being game designer? Should I just go back to making weird conceptual things? I don't know. Um, but what irks me is that I have had this experience which drove me to make art, which is you walk into a gallery or a museum and you see something totally amazing and it's this like transcendental moment where you just stare at it and you like can feel the weight of the piece. Um, and then I would play games and I would never have this moment, even though I love games and I had wonderful, I played wonderful games and I played mind blowing games and games have changed my life and inspired me to do all sorts of things. But I've never had this moment where there's just like a weight from the, the thing. Um, and so I think about this a lot. Um, and I realized that one of the reasons why games don't do this is they're just, it's a, just a different medium. Like when you build a game, you're building a system and a system is built to be explored and when you're exploring something, you're in this like moment where you're understanding all of it and you're engaging with it and it's different than a weight being pressed upon you from an artwork or some thing that you see. It's, that's a receptive moment and when you're playing a game, you're engaging and so the experience you have is just fundamentally different. Um, and that doesn't make it better or worse, it's just different. And after I started thinking about it that way, I had a lot more of an okay time doing games and making this the thing that I was doing and feeling like the stuff that I was working on was important. Um, and where this is going um, is that what I realized is that when you make a game, you're building a system. And systems are really cool. Like Systems are basically like functions in math, which you're all super familiar with, I'm sure. You basically like put in like a parameter, and then the system spits back out another parameter. Um, and I think this is pretty amazing, because the more that I think about it, um, that's sort of a very special thing that you can't really do when you're trying to be expressive in a very particular way. Like a system is this amazing, beautiful thing that lasts beyond us and it answers questions and it's meant to answer certain very specific questions which we assume that game players will be asking. But systems actually can answer anything because they're a system. And especially digital systems can really answer anything because you can hack them and you can work up against their sort of rigidness. When you hack a game, like a physical game that you're playing like Tag, you're cooperating with it and the game is cooperating with you to do what you want or to change the way you want it. But when you hack a video game, the game is against you. It's opposed to this action. And I think there's a really fantastic moment that you can have with hacking old video games or modding old video games or seeing what happens when you make one small little change in something. And I think it's really powerful that we get to design things that can react to that. And when I was thinking about it this way, I thought back to earlier works that I did, I have a minute left, um, that were about, um, yeah, I'm not gonna go through any of them, sorry <laughs> for all your hard work. Um, I th thought about all these things that I had done. Um, one easy example is I did a game like four years ago called Lose Lose, which is like in Space Invaders, but it destroys your files when you shoot enemies on the screen. That's the really, really rough, 10 second version. Um, but the idea is like when I looked at that again, I realized like this thing, this conceptual statement, this like thing that I was putting out into the world was actually more of a mod than it was an artifact. Oh, no, there's a lot you don't even wanna. <laughs> um, this thing, it was like a mod to an existing thing that was out there. And then I realized like in this really weird way, I'm worried about like the validity of what I'm doing versus um, with games versus these statements I was making, but in a lot of ways, what I'm doing with games encapsulates these statements. It's building these worlds that other people can then mod and question and address. All the conceptual art that I did and now do fits into mods, which is a weird way to think about something that you previously thought of as like a product or an object. And so with all this rambling, kind of what I wanna address is that in the last panel, uh, Bernie, the Coven was talking about, or not the last panel, in the keynote, he was talking about how like laughing is sort of an act of um, activism or playing in a public space, like these things that are outside of the norm. And so what I kind of want to say is that I actually think that making games, no matter how bland or boring they are, is in some way an act of activism because we're putting together a system that people can ask questions to. We're looking at the culture around us and we're taking all of our experiences and we're turning them into something. And it doesn't matter if that something is a game about a you know, conventional thing going on like Unmanned or if it's a stupid boring word game um, like Spell Tower or if it's an RPG like Final Fantasy VI. These are things that are like encapsulated that other people later down the line can ask questions to and find importance in. 
Um, and that's how I sort of feel like I'm kind of appropriate here, maybe, once. Uh, and our last short presentation, a uh, big applause for Kahu Abe. Hello. So um, I'm the artist in residence at the NYU Poly Game Innovation Lab, and I make, woo, <laughs> and I make, um, I make digital games that are played in the physical world, um, hoping to bring people together face to face. Um, game. This is the game innovation lab screen capture of the website. Um, I work with a lot of physical uh, interfaces that I make uh, by hand uh, from, and I use the Arduino a lot. Um, I use tools like the Arduino and processing for most of my games. Um, this is a game that I made uh, that's called Mary Mac 5000, and it is a little girl's clapping game like Mary Mac and Patty Cake that you might be uh, familiar with, um, but I repackaged it as a badass rocker sort of uh, metal game, and um, I've taken the same lyrics from the original uh, songs that I sang on the playground and um, asked professional musicians to re-record it in a metal type style. Um, and then you see those uh, um, silvery pads are um, basically contact sensors. And then there's like an, a whole circuit inside that little console thing. Um, and this is some badass people playing it. Um, another game that I made uh, is called Ninja Shadow Warrior. And um, you can see the bunnies, ninja bunnies, um, that are cut out of vinyl. Um, it's an arcade um, photo booth, arca uh, photo booth arcade game, um, where uh, I wanted to encourage people to play together, um, but through strategy and not um, not through the rule set. Um, and so basically, people have to become ninjas and try to hide from their enemies by becoming certain objects in the ninja palace. Um, and when you have more people, you can fill those objects out more accurately. And this is like an example. There's a drum, you see the drum image, and then people trying to become the drum. Um, that's Zach right there on the left. <laughs> um, but this is a game called Hit Me, uh, which I'll, I'm showing here um, at Indiecade. Um, and it's a two-person game where you try to hit the other person on their button. Um, and when you do, there's a camera that's embedded in your hat, and it takes the snapshot. Um, if you can see your opponent in the snapshot, then you can get extra points. Um, and then this is another shot. Uh, and it's also sort of made for spectators, um, not just the players. So there's like a projected interface. Um, so that the spectators can know what's happening. Um, oh yeah, this is the projected interface. And then, um, and also, uh, I was a fellow here. <laughs> okay, my, my first question would be, and I'll, uh, I think I'll spit that over to Paolo, is uh, because you, you had an interesting, uh, analysis of what, what indie could be, or maybe should be in your case. And uh, my question would be, that's the old, I actually don't give a shit if games are art or art is games or something, I, that's not interesting for me as a, as a perspective to talk about that. But what I'm very interested in is uh, the perception of what's going on. I'm usually a little bit, as an artist and, and doing a lot of shit in the art practice, uh, the main problem with the art space is always that it's, you know, it's just the art space. Art is just art because you expect certain rules and certain things from art. Uh, some people would, would never ever go into a gallery uh, uh, to, to even go close to that thing that is called art. Art is a special place for special people, that's what I would call it that way. Yeah? Uh, your approach is a very outreaching approach. So you do your stuff, you, you have a certain message that you want to convey or, 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 or bring out there into the world. And I find it quite interesting that you use games as the means of that transport or communication. Would you agree with that or am I going too far? 
Yeah, 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 sure. Uh, well, you know, you know it better than me. Like, uh, and uh, sometimes we tend to, you know, to conceptualize uh, art as a fine art, as a gallery, museum sort of oriented art, which is not really the case. There are so many other uh, cultural practices that are engaging uh, other spaces and other, like even like media spaces, and uh, you are you are part of that. Um, yeah, or, or like I-beam, everything in I-beam is like not exactly, yeah. Digi what is that? Digital art. <laughs> yeah, you can touch it. Um, yeah, uh, yeah. so like uh, to me, uh, it, it's, it's weird because I was sort of caught off guard when uh, there was the whole like game, uh, art versus game debate uh, a few years ago because uh, I was like, uh, I have like a, a, like probably like sim similar to, to Zach, I have like this uh, kind of artistic background, I guess, and uh, and the exciting thing about games is that you can transcend this uh, uh, horrible white cubes uh, and this like very exclusive and uh, self-referential uh, uh, language and self-referential audience. And so it's like, uh, oh, games are cool because they are not art. And uh, and, and then you, you, you had this other sort of like discourse that was like, oh yeah, let's really try hard to be art. Uh, let's try hard to get into the galleries and to have that kind of reputation. To me, like the interesting and uh, potentially uh, politically interesting thing about games is that, is that they are a popular medium and then it can be like twisted and approached and approached in different ways, but they are already kind of on the map and then they don't, you don't have that sort of distance. Uh, yeah, in, in my personal approach, it's always a way of t how to frame the whole thing. It's almost a tactical decision what you call yourself in a specific moment. For example, I call myself an artist whenever there's the chance of being arrested, because if it's art, then it's a little, there's a s protective niche for art in certain, a a especially if you're doing activism. Uh, my question for you would be, do you, do you feel the same thing, that you were kind of like balancing what to call yourself in certain, uh, you know, like scenes? or certain uh, fields? Um, no, no, actually. <laughs> um, I just call myself an artist, because for a really long time, I couldn't explain to anybody what I did, because it's impossible. Um, because when you do weird new media art five years ago, and no one's heard of it, no one's still heard of new media art, but five years ago, it was really bad. And especially like trying to explain things to my family, like it's impossible. So I would just say artist. And actually for a while, I was like really having a hard time with it. This is a complete side note and not interesting, but I lived in, I live in New York. And so I'm in Brooklyn a lot and hipsters are always like being like artists. Like, and then I said like, fuck them. Like, I'll just use it anyway. <laughs> But in, in, that, in that case, then it is a tactical uh, decision because you just say, I don't want to explain myself. I just want, want to do interesting thing that is kind of like groundbreaking or not. It's playing with rules, whatever it is. But the, the moment I don't, have, I don't have to explain to you what it is, so I just call it art. And yeah, I, I think that's... But I, don't, I think it's more that I just want to get beyond it. Like I want somebody to just be like, oh, okay, and then they can look at anything or we can have a conversation or, like I don't really think to me the, the interesting conversation is not like how, how does what I do address the world at large. It's like, let's talk about specifics. Let's have a conversation about something. Like, uh, I think for example, like, um, and I'm starting my question f for you with, with a zombie reference, I'm sorry. Uh, because there is, I've been part of the movement, uh, like the zombie flash mob movement for a long time. A friend of mine actually came up with the idea a long, long time ago in San Francisco. And a zombie flash mob is not political per se. The only thing that makes it political is when a thousand people are running, screaming through the streets and are zombies. That's what it makes it political. Zombies is like, so it's, it's the, 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 the medium, of the zombie is not political, but the medium of being out there and disrupting uh, society and just like being there out there is, is, is the interesting aspect. And I always think about that kind of stuff uh, when I think of architecture and when architecture becomes art or art becomes architecture because you cannot avoid architecture. Architecture is always out there. It's, it's like one of the most interesting media because, well, we live in that shit every day and, and there's so much discussion about art as architecture and architecture as art. So uh, from that perspective on how, going back to that, how revolutionary do you think you, you are? <laughs> because I think you very much. <laughs> I am the good school girl, always doing the homework, being 
uh, snobbish and everything else you can imagine. So I never had the feeling of being revolutionary or, but strong-minded, yeah, so much. Uh, <laughs> um, so uh, there is an intention in the work to be critical, but almost the intent, also the want, the wish to hide it very, very much so that it's not, uh, uh, it doesn't appear, you, you're not really admitting that you're being critical, I guess. And about architecture um, being potentially, um, uh, you know, a strong point. Everything in architecture costs so much. You cannot be really be Indian architecture. You can build for third world, yes. You need somebody that has money to build. So even the most ancient building, the fact that they built a library in Venice uh, Main Square, and it's a famous, beautiful building, they did it because Rome has been stolen by uh, the German or the French invading Rome and burning the books. So they said, hey, our books are safe, fuck you. That, there was not this highly elegant intent. It's always been political architecture. The, the big work of French presidents, the, the choice of the architect. Um, uh, so there's no doubt that architecture is political, but I, when I think of my practice is, um, I'm, I'm surprised to be here, I guess. <laughs> yeah. no. Okay, so, no, no, don't have to be surprised to be here. So my, <laughs> uh, my, my, okay, let, let, let's reframe it. My, my, I know many architects who are so frustrated because they love the work, they, they like to, to do interesting things, and then in the end, because they cannot fulfill their visions, and out of this, like, interesting frustrations with the restrictions of the money you need for architecture, then they end up creating game spaces, they end up uh, ending up, like, like one, of my, one of the most radical artists I know uh, in Germany and, and in Austria, he was an architect and he was so, f he was so fed up with, with not being able to make his vision come true, so he ended up as like one of the most critical uh, artists uh, in, in Austria at the moment. And I find that very interesting how, how the DNA of a, of a structure can kind of like shape kick you out of the system. I mean, it can never kick you completely out of the system, but it can at least trigger to, to play with it. Uh, I, 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 feel, I think of myself as an architect. Uh, I am very interested in the game and just came to realize how interesting they are, but I don't think myself as a game designer. And horrible to say here, I don't want to be a game designer, I want to be an architect. Uh, uh, as much as I like what I do with games, but to me, it's, it's, it's I'm being an architect in the way I work with the things I do, and I think that um, I'm using uh, the, the, the game have this really great thing. Who is that? That's John. <laughs> <laughs> I do feel there's so many analogies between art, uh, sorry, architecture and games, and I think I've mentioned that before. They both have very strict uh, um, needs to work. Architecture needs to stand up, it doesn't have co to collapse, and games needs rule. And they both, by creating limit, you actually create the possibility for something that you can control, which is our building may be used as a game is being played. So I do find them very, very similar in the way we uh, work together. And both of them needs, at the same time, to be very rigid and, and a strong designer mind, and at the same time also accept that you don't control all what's coming. You may just uh, create option for something that happens. And that may be the part that makes it uh, um, potentially revolutionary or, or controversial or open to um, to criticism more than other discipline. Okay. Uh, Kaho, uh, thanks for your presentation and you've been working uh, what, what, what I really find interesting and that's where really interesting stuff emerges is when kind of like uh, the barrier between the different scenes is kind of washed away. When game designers start talking with activists, when activists start talking with, with hackers, etc. And usually it's a very comfy, that's what I call the comfy peer groupness. Like yeah, you, 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 don't, you don't stick your nose out of the window 
because you feel just fine in your own uh, scene that you're, you're doing. And I think a lot of more interesting works could emerge and an interesting also political work could emerge if those scenes would, would work together more, yeah? I mean, I think you're a, you're a good example for, for like the transcendence of, of, of scenes and just like going out there and, and doing your work in hackerspaces, in the art context. Could you talk a little bit about, was that uh, hard for you to do? Or did it just like happen uh, because, you know, you met the right people? <laughs> um, that's a good question. I think that um, it just happened. And I mean, but I think that also, you know, um, I, I'm not an engineer. And um, you know, part of the things that I use are really accessible tools and things. And um, you know, I'm I'm part of that sort of DIY world, and I like, you know, hacking, you know, some commercial electronics, I guess, um, and and playing around with things like that. Um, and um, I don't know, it it all kind of, you know, worked out like that. Um, yeah. <laughs> oh, um, I have a, f uh, a background in fashion design. Oh, hello. I have I have a background in fashion design. So um, I designed clothing for uh, many years, uh, and um, but I really like games. <laughs> Maybe better than more than fashion <laughs> so yeah I mean I think I'm I'm been lucky to meet so many people and um, yeah and be able to to make the things that I make um, and yeah I was r really asking the question like meeting the right people because usually it's kind of hard in all geek scenes or nerd scenes you almost all the time uh, have to find almost s someone like a mentor because it's not a given thing that you go to a hackerspace who are very, of course, tell themselves they're inclusionist and this and that, but then you go into the hackerspace and people don't even get up from their computers and they're not talking to you. So it's not that, that nerd culture is per se an open culture. You have to kind of like make it your own and sometimes you have to be stubborn about that kind of kind of things. So that's, that's why I was interested in, in, in that kind of aspect. Uh, Paolo, uh, as, uh, as a political critic, uh, what do you think work could be, where, where do we need more uh, tempering or screwing around, let's call it that way, uh, in, in, in the different indie scenes, may it be the hacking scene or the indie computer gaming scene, uh, where, because how can we bring all those wonderful people together a little bit more than they are. I think that art is an interesting playground for that. That's why I have it in this panel, because art kind of like opens up a certain slot for people with interesting ideas going there. But not everyone is interested in art, you know? Uh, yeah, uh, we weren't planning this, but yeah, I can plug in something interesting. Uh, so there is this, uh, th this conference in Detroit called the Align Media Conference in which we, um, well, they just started the, um, uh, track uh, about about games, but that's a media activist conference. So like uh, there are like video artists and uh, all, all kind of uh, shades of, uh, of activism. Well, in the progressive radical, obviously, side. But um, yeah, and I think that there, there, there can be a, a lot of interesting exchange in there. It's like, imagine like if you ever heard of Games for Change, it's like Games for Change, but way better, more interesting and not, not boring and uh, yeah. So, like, I think that 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 can be like a potential like a uh, uh, future um, dark room for people to mingle, intermingle, and uh, screw each other. I have more. Thanks. Um, I also wanted to say on that point, like, I think one of the things that I know I've talked to some of my friends about. Um, is that like another way to do this, which we think is kind of interesting, is instead of going to like the core of gamers and going to the core of some other group and being like, how do we get these people to meet? Instead, just saying like, all right, so we really like games. How do we just rapidly expand games and just claim stuff? Because I think there are lots of interactive artists who are doing stuff that is fantastic and games. 
and they don't call it games because they don't care about games and they don't understand what games are. And I think like claiming those things as games opens up that conversation with them where they're like, wait, this is not a game. And then you're like, yes, it is. Here's why. And then also it expands our definition of games for everybody in games because then you're looking and you're like, yeah, what's this? So let's call it radical dis discurvization of things. There's like claiming spaces, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, that's a very feudal approach. I like that. Uh, okay, uh, okay. So, uh, uh, so, do you think that you as an architect are claiming game, a game, the game space for you, or is it the other way around? Th this is more cup or counseling, I guess, for me. <laughs> Uh, the, the artists I've been working with and that I really liked, they um, were much more uh, openly um, political and, and controversial in the installation that they were doing. Uh, I don't know, some of them in Cuba representing the big state collapsing or anyway, very directly political. But the form was so minimalistic that I find it, uh, um, how to say, I, I'm going to say something that is going to be disruptive, right? <laughs> uh, I am personally, I would feel uncomfortable to do the work that does Paolo because I can be so loud and open and, and shout and, 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 and lift the, 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 the fist. So I have to find a way that uh, it's a little s not too loud to tell it. And I think that with games, I, I, I can work well with that, uh, and architecture does uh, can do that too, without being so open as it would be writing or uh, using words or um, direct images, for example, that are very representative. So I, I just see that it's both the two things. I'm not sure if I'm answering your question, but they fit well to what I'm trying to do because they are not uh, Directly explicit in 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 their um, in their uh, conscious social approach that I want to bring in some way. Um, so I, it doesn't matter too much to me if it's game or architecture. Really, uh, they they both work well. I'm 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 very interested in the way how subversion could work in in in, in that sense because subversion doesn't. Of course, subversion has an an uh, has has a political core, but how that works is a different thing. I mean, I, I, I don't think that, you know. Uh, what Zach was also mentioning about being an artist, how he feels about game or the two things he feels, I have a little bit that uh, feeling too because person sometimes tells me I'm a game designer and I feel, oh no. Uh, but it really doesn't matter finally. It's just way to touch different chords and um, you can reach all of the spectrum with all of uh, dif with different media, but that's okay. I, um, I, I'm, I like to see both of them happening. Kaho, because uh, most of your stuff is very do-it-yourself and you're working in uh, do-it-yourself spaces. Uh, do you think that the basic notion of do-it-yourself can change something uh, in, in, in the way we approach uh, art and gaming? So, do you think there should be more do-it-yourself out there? <laughs> because some people are just like shaking their fist and saying, no, no, do-it-yourself will just like make everything just worse because people who don't know shit about nothing just make their own shit and then don't know nothing and, you know, yeah, yeah. Who so that? Uh, oh, there, there are, oh, fuck, yeah. There, oh, yeah, yeah, especially in the art world, you would not believe how, how fucking crazy motherfuckers are out there. Uh, <laughs> And, 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 and what they think is revolutionary and what not, and so like, oh my God, yeah. But, uh, yeah. I'll be, I'll be the first to, you know, admit that, like, some of the things that I make are very junky. And, like, I'm, I'm stressing out, like, right now, because at 4 o'clock I'm supposed to show hit me, and, you know, I don't know if it works or not, and I won't know until I set it up, and then maybe, you know, I have my soldering iron in case some wires are disconnected and stuff like that, and this is the stress that I go through every time I'm showing a game, right? And then, you know, I come up with, I come, I arrive with backups of backups in case something breaks, or something gets smashed, I can try to fix it right there. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, 
it, it's something that I struggle with also, like I, you know, this DIY stuff. But at the same time, I think that it's a great place to start, you know, um, creating, be, being creative um, with your own ideas and projects. Um, and so w once you learn the basic tools, like if you learn how to use the Arduino and how to use, you know, switches and sensors with the Arduino, then, I mean, you can make so many things. And, you know, and, and, um, and this, you know, you can even have one button, you know, and that can create a game or, um, or that can be an interface for a game. I mean, there's just so many ways that you can go about it. And I think that that DIY world really opens that up for people. So yes. I can tell you why, why Natalie's work is revolutionary. Okay. <laughs> All right. I can tell you why Natalie's work is and, uh, and Eric's work uh, is revolutionary, I think. I'm not qualified to talk about architecture, but every time I meet one, you know, an architecture student, they seem to be like all very into this uh, mindset of becoming like superstar uh, architects, the one who make, you know, like the big museums or the big institution. And you want to do that too? <laughs> yeah. Sure, <laughs> but uh, yeah, very something, very something a, a little bit disturbing. I can see why it's uh, super exciting to, to you know like to just stick your uh, uh, big phallus, uh, uh, you know, like in like <laughs> in the mi in the middle of the city. Uh, well, in Barcelona, there is a big a big one, uh, <laughs> or in London, uh, yeah. Uh, but the, uh, to me, like the fact that you are applying those principles and the skills, and you're like, oh, you know what, I'm not, I'm gonna do this, and uh, I don't need to be to become w w part of this uh, weird uh, elite to, to me like already applying this to a kind of like a folk uh, uh, situation a pop popular situation in which everybody is basically invited to uh, to me is already like a shift of context that is extremely like uh, re revolutionary in a way that's what I think thanks a lot